99.9 Punk World Radio FM. You guys already know what time it is. And tonight we are joined by a phenomenal, legendary individual. That's right. We got Tony Lovato. He is the four founding member and lead singer of the iconic group Mest right here live on Punk World Radio. How are you doing this evening? Good, man. Quite, quite the introduction. <laughs> I definitely try my best, man, to give individuals like yourselves their accolades when, when it's due, man. And you guys made such amazing music. And I know we're going to get into that in the interview. But I got to say, man, how's everything going with yourself out there in California? Um, everything's great, man. Just uh, currently living the dad life right now. because we, uh, we played some shows over the past couple months and was uh, working on the new record over the past year and a half and stuff. So. It's it's sort of a little bit of downtime, but it's it's not really because we're scheduling tours and we just shot some videos and stuff. But you know, like like today was like waking up at six thirty, taking my son to school, picking him up from school, going to the gym, straightening up the backyard because my daughter's first birthday party is coming up. So you know, it's like, uh, and then talking with my agent about tours and sorting out dates. So it's like a mixture of dad life and musician. Hey, well, you, you can never go wrong with any of that stuff. It definitely sounds like you're living the dream life there, Tony. For sure. Not, there's no, uh, no complaints on this end. And also, taking you back to the beginning of this, uh, of this legendary band, in 1995, yourself, your brother, uh, Steve, and your cousin Matt actually founded the band well, I, I, that we all know today as a mess. But I was wondering if you can actually tell our viewers a story behind the humbling beginnings of this legendary band. And, of course, what actually made you three decide to come together to form, uh, to form Mess? Well, uh, we, we had been playing in bands since we were little kids. Like, I think we had like our first metal cover band when we were like seven, eight, nine years old. And we would just play like Judas Priest and Rolling Stones, like ter ter terribly done, obviously. Like <clears throat> I would play like the guitar and play fucking single note uh, chords. Like I wasn't, you know, really playing the guitar. And, so we were always around music. My father was a musician. He was in a cover band, stuff like that. Um, so just through those years of just having instruments around and, and always uh, playing in different, I was in an alternative band with my brother and Jeremiah, who joined the band after my brother. Um, <clears throat> we had an alternative band called the Cosmic Frogs in like, I don't know, 92 or 93, where we'd play like, our own original songs, but then we'd like cover like Pearl Jam and shit like that. Um, so it was just another venture on into, you know, the music world, so to speak. And also, uh, very early on in your guys' career, you actually got signed to a major label by the name of Maverick. I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about that record deal. And of course, how did you guys actually land that particular deal with Maverick at the time? Because they really released majority of your guys' records in the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, um, we had been a band for about four years, um, releasing little demo cassettes. Uh, then we finally... Uh, put a couple of those together, recorded a couple of new songs and re released our first uh, DIY CD called um, Mo Money More Forties. Um, put that out. Um, and then, you know, I was just, I would just go to shows all the time and give CDs to the bands that I liked and talk business bullshit, you know, just, just trying to get to know people and all that type of stuff. And, you know, um, John Feldman, singer Goldfinger was one of those, uh, one of those guys. And, he happened to venture into his uh, a and r producing career right around 98 ish um and just through uh you know hounding him and giving him music and stuff like that um finally one of the um we agreed to let us open for them um at one of the shows and then we opened up for them at house of blues and we had a shit ton of people there like we sort of became the, the local band in chicago that um whenever there was national acts coming through and the booking agent or the promoter was looking for a local band um we would be the ones to play those shows so um we had done a couple of those like played the metro and house of blues stuff like that but then when we played the goldfinger show which is sold out goldfinger show um i think that holds like 17 or 1900 something like that and, well they used to put in 1900 people i don't know if that was legal um yeah. But uh, we opened up for Goldfinger. John watched some of our set, and we had a you know a couple hundred people singing all the words. Crowd was going off, and so I think it impressed John enough that he's you know told me to keep sending him music. And 
Um, I believe one of the four song demos I sent him, um, it had Electric Baby on it, and which was on uh, First Record Wasting Time. Um, and he heard that song and he was like, okay, you're a, you're a pop punk band, but you could fucking write songs. And so I think that was the initial sort of, uh, sort of light bulb in his head of, okay, if, if they can write some more songs this good, then, you know, he can make something happen for us. And uh, yeah, he just, I mean, uh, Maverick was hungry at the time and he had just got done doing our friend's band show off. Um, and so he, without Maverick Records even hearing a fucking song, um, he talked to Guy Seri, who was the president of the label at the time, eventually our a and guy, um, asked him, uh, told him about the band and uh, secured us a demo deal, which was insane because they had never seen us live. Technically, it was, you know, it's a subsidiary of a major label, but they had money from Candlebox and Alanis Morissette selling fucking 25 million records. And um, so, yeah, we got flown out to California and recorded four songs and they heard them. And a week later, they uh, signed us. Pretty unheard of. I got to say, it definitely sounded like those those shows in Chicago, but just being the opening act for all these big bands definitely really helped you get in the get your foot in the door with a, with a lot of legendary individuals, especially John Feldman. Yeah, I mean, when you, <clears throat> I mean, we busted our ass for four years, you know, and putting on our own shows, um, and it was just, you know, I felt like we were working hard enough and and you know, fucking doing what we needed to do to become that band in Chicago. Like I always had a strategic idea of how things should be done where a lot of local bands will play every show they're offered every weekend in the same area. And it's just like, to me that, that doesn't create any want. And it was overset. Like, I mean, when you become a national act, then it's the same concept in my brain of now that I know it's being a national act. Um, but I was already thinking it on the smaller scale when I wasn't knowledgeable about being a national act. Um, that you're oversaturating a market in a way. And so I <clears throat> would talk to the guys and I was convinced them like, hey, but like, we need to play a show like once a month if that, or somehow figure out how to get on these, these bigger shows and do things so that when we play, it's an event. It's not just, oh, Mess is playing, why are you gonna come see the band that many times, right? So we, after doing that for a while, then we slowed it down. I was like, well, let's, let's concentrate on writing songs and get that thing going and place shows here and there, but shows that matter. Um, so yeah, so it, it was, you know, that was just part of uh, like my, the way my brain works, you know, I'm always thinking bigger picture and uh, like marketing and, and just a way to, to get to the next level, so to speak. And so it was just sort of fell in line with busting our ass for four years. And then, you know, a lot of bands have to do a bunch of uh, showcases for major labels and shit like that. And it takes a while, but, <clears throat> we landed in the right hands, you know, so it worked out. And also on October 29th of 2001, you guys actually released my personal favorite album uh, titled Destination Unknown that actually peaked at number 12 on the uh, Heat uh, US Billboard. I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about this phenomenal record. And I know, of course, you previously worked with John Feldman from the very beginning, but what was it like just watching John Feldman work on this particular album in the studio? Because when he gets behind those boards, he is truly like a magnificent, magnificent producer. Yeah, John definitely knows what he's doing uh, production-wise. And, and he taught us a lot uh, within the early records um, because, you know, like I would be, <clears throat> I would write songs and they would sometimes be a little lengthy. Um, so, you know, that's one of the big first things you learn is like, if you're listening to a song and it's sort of like, it loses your attention, it's like, okay, maybe that part shouldn't be there, you know? Um, but uh, that was, so uh, we did Wasting Time and technically that was a failure because they're two major labels because major labels but that was when people still bought cds and records and shit and we only sold like 30 or forty thousand records um which back then was a failure nowadays it's probably considered a success um but so that record almost didn't even get made <clears throat> um after Shaw's first record they dropped them so we were i had to say next in line to to get dropped if things didn't work out um but uh they saw our live show and I think they, I think the label saw something there that was like, okay, we gotta, they're doing their part. We gotta figure out our part. I think is what the label was sort of realizing. Um, and so 
we sort of did the same thing. We went back out to California. I think we recorded five tracks. Um, and John submitted them to the label. I think John even put together like a live video for hotel room to sort of show the label, like almost showcasing us again. Like, yo, this is what happens when they play live. And video, it's somewhere online to like on YouTube or something, but it's, it's fucking rad. Um, and so after they heard those five songs, then they were like, okay, let's record the rest of another record here. Um, so like, I don't think I even processed, in my brain, I was always like, we're gonna record a second record no matter what. Um, but then when it was like, okay, we're doing five songs, I was like, oh, this is weird, but all right, well, I'll go through these fucking steps or whatever it takes. Um, but I was, and I was just confident that it was going to happen. I never had that thought that it wasn't going to happen. Like looking back now, I'm like, fuck, we were really close to not making that record. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it was cool. We had like, uh, Gabe and Steven from No Doubt came in and played horns on, uh, one of the, uh, reggae songs. Um, uh, Monique from Say Ferris sang on a track, um, Young MC did some uh, DJ scratching stuff on Cadillac, which was really cool. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a definitely a fun record, you know, record to make for sure. And so that was, you know, and, and then I remember being on tour too. I'm sorry if you have another question. I'm going to sort of telling the story. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. Honestly, I, I love the stories, man. So definitely like you have the floor. <laughs> one of the, one of the really cool things about that record too, is that, um, Although a fan favorite and we sold a good amount of those records, it took some time to do it. But initially we were on tour. Were we doing our first? I don't know if we were doing our first headlining tour or if we were out supporting. But I think the record came out like November 6th or 5th or something around then. I can't remember. But we were on the road. And back in the day, how you would get your CDs in stores is labels would or um, uh record stores would obviously look at your last record sales and see what you had did. And so that's how many, you know, they were in their brain, what they would order and what they would sell. So they didn't realize that we had this grassroots following grassroots following of, of touring so much over those year and a half, two years between racing time and, and destination unknown. So I remember being on tour, the, we we're like, okay, records coming out this day. And it was like, we started getting calls from our label that they were sold out in every store kids were complaining they couldn't get it and it's because the record stores like always thinking of the business under ordered everything um and we ended up selling like over six thousand records our first week obviously we would have sold a lot more than that if it was available so that sort of put a spark under uh the ass of our label too realizing like okay now we got to somehow convince these uh these record stores to start to get these records in so people can buy them you know um, but I always remember that because that was actually a really cool thing. It's, I'm always the, I always root for the underdog. Um, maybe because I've been an underdog most of my life. Um, but that was, I remember that was a really cool thing hearing, getting those phone calls that, you know, it was sold out in every store and they, you know, were trying to get them back in stock and shit. So that definitely helped with uh, the next step of the band for sure. And also, before we move off the topic of this amazing record, one of your guys' most famous songs actually came off that album. And I know you mentioned it briefly uh, a few moments ago. Is actually the song titled Cadillac. I was wondering if you can actually tell us a story behind that song. Because honestly, going back to that year of 2001 and just hearing this song, it was very advanced for its time. Like, just the way you guys put that together was such a unique, very unique, but killer song at the same time. Yeah. Um, shit, you know, like... That's one of those songs that everybody loves, but it's it's just a simple song. Like, I mean, if you look at, you know, fucking 90% of our catalog, there's a lot of very meaningful songs and lyrics in these songs. Um, that's more of the, but, but, you know, at the same time, we like to have fun. Um, our live show is all about having fun and giving people an hour. Sorry, if you can hear my daughter, she's singing in the background. Um, but, uh, I don't know, like, I, I can't remember, like, the concept of how it came up, but it was essentially about, uh, so I drove out to, I lived in Chicago at the time, and I drove my 66 Cadillac all the way to Florida and did a road trip down there. Me and Nick, drummer at the time, we did a trip down there, and I hung out for about a week before we then flew to California to do the record. 
Um, so I wrote that song while we were making the record. And uh, it was just sort of about that trip in a way of just like driving across country in your fucking, in a car, you know, just having a good time type of like summer fun fucking anthem type of song. Um, they actually did make us change some lyrics uh, in the song because I'm trying to think what the line was. Um, I think it was, it was because they didn't want a lyric about drinking and driving in it. But technically, I think I was saying that my girl was showing up, so they people are supposed to take it into terms that she would then be uh, driving the car, not me. Uh, but they weren't okay with it. <clears throat> so I can't remember which line it was, but I had to change one of the lines because the label was a little scared of that. But um, yeah, it was just about, you know, fucking driving around with your friends, having a good time, the Friday night type of shit. Um, and I think when I wrote the chorus initially, it was like CGF. And then somehow I figured it sounded cool to put that heavier chord in there of going C, G flat, F. And so it just had its own own vibe to it, you know? And also as well, you actually appeared in three of Good Charlotte's music videos with the most notable one actually being the anthem. I was wondering, how did you actually first get connected with the band Good Charlotte? And of course, what was it like just actually being a part of that particular music video, the anthem? Um, okay, yeah, I remember being in the anthem. I don't know the other two hours, in. but um, uh, yeah, well, I think we were actually making our third record at the time uh, when they were doing that video. So it, we were probably just hanging out and then uh, they're like, yeah, we're doing a video. It's a party video. And what's crazy is there's a bunch of dudes in that video now that, <clears throat> that I'm friends with that I didn't even know back then. And then like, uh, you know, after some time of hanging out, <clears throat> I was like, oh, wait, you were in that fucking video too? And so, like, there's a bunch of dudes in the video, like Rick Thorne and uh, my buddy Scummy, who's a metal militia dirt bike rider I'm friends with. And he was in the, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's fucking, that's Colin. Um, but uh, how I met those dudes, we were on tour with, <clears throat> we were on tour with Goldfinger. And uh, they came out to a show to see us because they were fans of Mest. Um, and because we had already done Wasting Time before they even recorded their first record. Um, so they knew John and John's like, hey, there's these kids coming out. They're in a band called Good Charlotte. Um, <clears throat> they're big fans of your band. I'm like, cool. So we met uh, that day. I think they came out to the show in New York and we just walked around, hung out all day in New York. And uh, I remember them telling me, like, you know, the, the, the whole summer that they had written their first record when they were recording it, they said they used to like, drive around listening to um, Wasting Time. All the time and so we just became friends through that and then it was like you know same era same genre same age so we just bonded became friends and you know toured together and also as well in the mid 2000s you actually went on to form another band uh called uh, kisses for kings i was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about that second music venture within your career and of course what ultimately made you decide to form this band uh back in uh, i believe it was 2006 if i'm not mistaken um, I think it's, I think Kiss for Kings was around, yeah, maybe 2007-ish, 2008, I don't know, it was a while ago. Um, yeah, I don't know, I mean, I had just separated from the guys from doing Mast, and, uh, it had been a couple years, and I just wanted to write some new music again, and at the time I wasn't really... I wanted just to like not really see I wasn't into like writing pop punk. I wanted to just write some different shit and see what it'd be like to write um some different music. And it was just it was just that adventure of like you know, being a musician wanting to write um some different songs, different styles, stuff like that. So I mean that was really why <clears throat> I did it, um, just to, to fill that void of, you know, writing songs and stuff. And also as well, in 2007, uh, Kisses for Kings actually had the had the opportunity to perform at the infamous Warp Tour. I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about that experience. And of course, what was one of your most fondest memories you shared while performing on the Warp Tour? Because I've heard stories from other members of other bands, and the Warp Tour is definitely one heck of a phenomenal party. Yeah. Um, we did, I don't know if we were Kisses for Kings at that point. I think that was another band called The Permanent Holiday. Um, and then permanently sort of turned into Kisses for Kings in a way, but there was a little bit of like 
musical change in that even. Um, but uh, it was cool, man. Like it was like, I think fucking Kevin forgot to put us on the roster that day. Um, so we had to scramble to find the stage to play and stuff like that. So it was cool. Like, I mean, when we did it with Mast, we did uh, 2003 main stage, 2005 main stage. Um, and we were obviously a brand new band, so we weren't gonna be on the fucking main stage. Um, so it was cool to see, it, it was sort of like living the other side of Warped Tour, all those other stages and shit. Um, but yeah, I mean, Warped Tour in general was just the best tour that was ever created. I mean, being a kid on Warped Tour, it's like, it's the, the summer you fucking dream of. It was, I mean, those summers were amazing, you know? And I got to say, I definitely agree. Like Warp Tour, if you're a punk, punk rock fan or just music in general, man, Warp Tour is definitely the place to be, even for even just as a spectator of the bands, man, because it's, it's it's loaded the entire weekend. Is just phenomenal, man. I, I never had the opportunity to go to one. I almost had the opportunity to go to the very last. I think it was a 25th anniversary show was the last one I had the opportunity but my actual ride fell through, so I couldn't go. But I've seen so many videos, and it's like, damn, man, I really missed out. Yeah, um, yeah, man. There's there's something special about uh, being with bands all day, watching every band you want to watch, the barbecues afterwards, the smell of hot piss on concrete. There's something very special about that for sure. Like I walked, I, I can't remember where I was at, but the other day we were somewhere, and we we're in some sort of parking lot. I think we're in Vegas and it just smelled like hot piss on the concrete. And I was like taken back in a way, like obviously it's still a disgusting smell, but scent is the strongest head of memory. And it was like fond memories of hot piss smelling fucking concrete in the summer. You know, there was something special about it. Hey, so some of those fans though, man, I, I don't blame them too for doing what they have to do. Cause if you have to pee, but you move, you lose your spot. So, I mean, you do what you got to do, I guess, but it's definitely uh, kind of messed up. <laughs> I mean, the rule was when like you wake up in the morning and if you got to take a dump, you get to that fucking porta potty before those doors open. Because after that, it's, you ain't going in there. So I get it. And also, with well, jumping ahead of the timeline uh, quite a bit there, but on January 17th of 2020, you guys actually released the amazing album titled uh, Masquerade. I was wondering if you can tell us a bit more about this album. And of course, like, wh uh, where can we actually buy or stream ourselves a copy of it today? Um, Masquerade is on every uh, streaming site that there is because um, we got it uh, distributed through Orchard Sony um, for the streaming shit. Um, <clears throat> And then I don't, we got some vinyl left in our merch store. It's uh, what the fuck's our merch store? Um, www.merch.limitedrun.com. So there's uh, I mean, we're almost out. I got like one or two small boxes of them, like small boxes. Um, but uh, so yeah, I mean, the we I had done a couple shows with the original guys again, and I was like had that record written and um considering we had played a couple shows together i sort of suggested to the guys i said you know it'd be cool to have you guys at least record on this record um, even though for the most part it was done um being written and demoed out in pre-production um so it took a minute to like schedule everybody um and sorted out a producer figured out all that shit um and then sent them all the pre-production recordings so they could learn the songs. And then um, Nick flew out on a weekend, Matt came out for a weekend and Jeremiah on separate weekends, put them in the studio for fucking 48 hours to you know do their parts. Um, but myself, I was in the studio for fuck two or three months straight doing everything else, you know? Um, but yeah, I made it with Cameron Webb. Uh, He's done Alkaline Trio, No Effects, Social Distortion. I mean, Lincoln Park, Kelly Clarkson, like, you know, Cameron's awesome. Um, it was fucking great to work with him to be, you know, if you're gonna be in the studio with somebody fucking, you know, two, three months, you, you know, you got a vibe with the person and Cameron's super laid back, super chill. Like, it was a pleasure to be around like a fucking, I love Cameron. Um, but it was, a, it was a fun record to make um, and, 
then so the original guys obviously can't tour uh because they do like their normal jobs and shit like that um but i had brought my new guys out with me for 2019 and we were touring a shit ton in 2019 to set up the release of that record um and then released it played a record release show um where actually adrian who was playing guitar with me at the time <clears throat> um, and then my keyboard player jessica they both played our record release show with us with the original guys in chicago i think that was january 17th is that or, so yeah so january 18th was the record release show because the 17th i think was the friday um played that show and then i sort of came home and was sort of waiting to find out the next tours and when we we're going to go back out and then started watching the news and then found out <clears throat> that i had to stay inside for two weeks and then i stayed inside for three weeks and you know so that sort of fucked up that record pretty good because for a band like us we you know we let people know we have new records out by being on the road and touring for the most part you know um so you know put out that record and then the world shut down for a couple of years and especially as well just putting a damper on the record obviously you know like you mentioned you go on tour to actually promote these albums but the fact that you actually had the original members of of mess actually back together for this album and then COVID hit is it is another low blow as well because it also gave like day one fans the chance to actually hear you guys back together and just like the way you were when during the first record drop so COVID definitely put a damper on a lot of shit. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that was a huge bummer. I mean, it wasn't like as if we were going to um, get out on the road with the original guys and tour or anything. But <clears throat> for me, it was like, I just told the guys, I said, hey, I can go in and, and record this record um, without you guys. But I go, I think it would be cool for the fans, you know, since we've been playing a couple shows over the past, you know, couple of years. I was like, I think it'd be, you know, a nostalgic, cool thing for the fans to at least have you guys playing on the record um but then you know scheduling just after that even like we tried to get together to do one show out here um well first it was canceled because of covid uh it was like april of 2020 and then i think they pushed it back to that summer of 2020 which it didn't happen then we said fuck it we're just gonna go all the way another year for that april same date of 2021 that couldn't happen and then uh, I think we tried to res we tried to reschedule three or four times, and then at the point that shows were open, I had given the guys like four or five dates over like a five month period of hey this date this date can we do it, and each one of them like individually couldn't do one of the shows. So um, and it was sort of like a thing for them like if we all can't be there then you know let's not do it. Um, and then for me it was like I was going on two and a half years of not playing a show. So I said, fuck it. I said, I got to do this show. So I brought up the new guys. <clears throat> we ended up playing that show. And that's sort of where we're at now. Like with the new record, <clears throat> Gary, my new drummer, played everything on the record. And so it's sort of like at this point, at this point, it's sort of like just moving forward um, <clears throat> and, and sort of just going to continue with, with doing what I'm doing now. And speaking of the new record, I know you brought it up just a few moments ago, and of course, at the very beginning of the interview, and I know, of course, this this album isn't released yet, so you can't release too too many details, but I do know a lot of the fans are on the edge of their seat pertaining to this album, so just, just di di dipping into it a little bit, what can we actually expect from this album when it does drop to the general public, and of course, what is the estimated release date of it as well? Um, as of right now, I'm just saying the record comes out in 2023. Uh, because things can always fucking change. That's that's the thing. Um, and for me, it this is one of those records that I think it's. I fucking listen to the record, and it's just it's twelve songs, and and it's like every song is that song. And I'm like, fuck, dude. Like, I want every Mess fan that's ever bought a record to hear this record. I want anybody who's heard of Mess and been like, well, I've never listened to anything, but well, you know, like, I want everybody to hear this record because. I think it's it's one of the best if it's not our best record. Like it's just fucking I we I mean every time we'd write a song, I'd go home listening to that song. Like I'd go in the studio, we'd come up with an idea, write the song, demo it out, and have it done by the time I left. And it was like twelve, you know, to fifteen hour days where we'd start with nothing and be fucking done with the song. Everything. And I'd be driving home because uh, I recorded the record up in um, 
in Beverly Hills. So for me, I live about an hour and 15 minutes away. So I drive home for an hour and 15 minutes and listening to the song on repeat. And every time I was like, fuck, this song, this is the song. And like, we're not going to fucking write another one this good. And then we go and write another song and I'd be like, fuck, this is the song. So, and like, so now when I listen to the record, it's like, I literally go back from every song being my favorite. It's just for various reasons. And every song is just, to me, is like, it's just a fucking like, lyrically, like it's one of those things where, you know, I think we wrote some good songs back in the day, like <clears throat> like sort of anthems for a time and a place, like Jaded, Rooftops, Drawing Board, um, that for me, like my favorite type of, like the people I looked up to and that influenced me were songwriters that, that sang stories in a way, because um, somehow that's how, that's, I would lyrically then relate to those songs. Um, and I remember listening to Social Source as a kid and, and hearing like story of my life and, and songs like that. Um, and so for me, when I was writing this record, it was like, and my life has changed a lot, obviously since the early 2000s, but I had that concept of, I wanna write this mess record that, that anybody that's listened to those first three records, three, four records, especially the first three, um, that they are hearing something that reminds them of those records, right? But then at the same time, I wanted to write a record that was better, I guess, like I wanted to progress, so to speak, not like out of the box of like, you know, well, we gotta, you know, we're, we're advancing as musicians, so we have to write this, you know, different type of music, right? It was more like, I wanna do what I was doing, but do it better. And especially like lyrically and stuff like that, and, and with the musical parts and stuff like that, and production and stuff. And um, it definitely takes a lot from our early three records, um, but I think it's like the fucking shiny new, fucking new, new, new fucking revision sort of thing. Um, and I mean, like I said, like lyrically to me, I, I've been showing people songs and everybody's like, fuck dude, like this is, this is my life. So I feel like I wrote all these anthems for shit that could have been written back then, but relates to the people in my demographic and the people that grew up with Mest. It relates to us now even more so, but like it could have worked back then too, but it's like, you know, it's about the youth, but it's about now it's, I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm fucking proud of this record and I think it's going to fucking blow people away. To be honest, I fucking, I think it's great, man. And when you said a few moments ago as well about how like you, every single time, time you record a song and it just outdoes the other one and all of them are your favorites, stuff like that as well also makes it really difficult uh, for, for, for yourself to actually choose what song to be the first single as well. Because you, if you love them all, you don't really know exactly what one to really choose sure. for that first single. Yeah, for sure. Um, but at that point when we when i wrote this song um i eventually changed some lyrics because i was laying in bed I, I don't sleep much um and i was laying in bed thinking listening to the song going over again i was like wait this is gonna fucking work too so i fucking got up wrote some shit in my notes uh probably text taylor my buddy um the drummer lit who produced the record probably text him at like three in the morning like yo dude this is it right here new lyric change for this fucking course like it was pretty close but then i I was like, this hook line is going to fucking work. Um, and then once we wrote it, it was like, okay, that's, this is the first single. Like it's, it's an easy fucking, it makes sense. It's going it, to, it sort of sums up, I want to say it sums up the record, but then we wrote another song after that called Wasted Youth. That's going to be the second single. And then we're like, once we wrote that song, we're like, fuck, this is the song. Well, we said, so sort of already set on the fact that the first song that we're releasing is going to be out. It's called When We Were Young. Um, so those are going to be the first two singles. Um, but I mean, yeah, like I, I, lyrically, man, when people hear these songs, they're going to be like, okay, cool. Thanks for fucking writing the story of my life. Like, I think that's my concept is I'm always like, I'm, I'm, I'm writing for myself, right? Like I'm writing my own shit that I've gone through, but you know, when somebody else hears a song and lyrically, they're like, it's like you're writing, like I showed a friend a couple songs and he was like, I feel like you get in my head and you write shit that I'm thinking about. And like, to me, that's like the biggest compliment, you know, like for people to relate that much to the shit that, that you're writing, you know? 
And I have to ask, because obviously we spoke about the brand new album that you guys actually are currently uh, cooking up in the studio. Obviously, you guys actually got a tour that you're currently uh, working on planning as well. But aside from the brand new tour and the brand new album, what is next for yourself, Tony? And of course, the rest of Mest as well. Like, Is there anything we missed during this evening's interview that you still want to talk about or promote? Well, we still got you here live on the Canadian FM dial this evening. Um, no, I mean, like, pretty sure we covered all the bases. I mean, <clears throat> you know... We got three three tours coming up. We're about to announce. Um, we shot a couple of videos. We'll shoot a couple more. There's some special guests on the new record, which is going to be awesome. Um, and uh, you know, it's we're just getting all the ducks in a row before we unleash the shit to everybody. You know, don't want to. After 2020, it's like. <clears throat> all right, maybe I can sit and wait and, and sort everything out properly before we release something because I don't want to. I mean, I love Masquerade. Don't get me wrong. I fucking, there's songs on that that record that I absolutely love. You know, like The Silence Left Behind, Masquerade, Don't Worry, Son. Um, I love those songs. But I don't want to put that much into a record and then have it go by the wayside because of, you know, unfortunate uncontrollable events so but yeah man i mean be, be the look be on the lookout for us uh for, i'm gonna be on the road as much as possible obviously um and uh you know uh, the thing i always say is if, if you're a fan of the band one of the things that you can do for a band like us is you know if you see a video clip or you see something if you share that shit on social media i don't think people realize how much that actually helps out a band um because i've been doing a couple of interviews here and there and it's like you know you see the comments of people that are just like Oh shit, Mess is still together. Fuck, Mess just put out, you know, put out a new record a couple of years ago. Like, the more people know, it's just it's getting it out there so people know, you know. And I'm like, social media, dude. I'm like, just hit fucking share. It's right there, you know. Like, easy to do, you know. So it's like two clicks of a button, and you never know that one share could blow up and get a million views. You never really know. For sure, for sure, it helps out a lot. And before we part ways here this evening, Tony, obviously I know how to follow, follow you on social media, but for the people that aren't quite aren't quite that social media savvy, how do they actually go about following not only yourself, Tony Lovato, but of course, Mest as well as a band? Um, so my name on Instagram is Anthony Lovato, L-O-V-A-T-O, just like Demi, although we're not sure if we're related at this point. Um, and then I'll tell you what the band one is because I always get this wrong. The official Mest, M E S T, is uh, Instagram. Uh, I'm sure if you search Facebook Mest, it's some shit will come up. But uh, Anthony Lovato and the official Mest is uh, our Instagram pages. And I'm going to say first and foremost, Tony, thank you so much for just giving not only myself, but the radio station airways a bit of your time. And I've been a huge Mest fan for so many years. So like I said, being able to speak with you this evening is such an honor. And I'll also thank you so much for making amazing music all these years. And not only myself, but millions of fans had the opportunity to enjoy for so many years, man. I'm super stoked for the new album and tour. And hopefully down the line, we can make this happen again sometime soon. But for now, definitely have yourself a kick-ass week. Absolutely, man. It's a pleasure. Uh, let me know when you want to do it again. Hey, definitely. Sounds great, Tony. Thank you so much. Have yourself a great night. You too, bud.